Hi, good evening, and I just wanted to check if the if the audio is actually going uh, uh, unmuted, but yeah, it is. Okay, so good evening to this 33rd Octopreneur Air broadcast on this lovely Friday evening. I'm your host, Gina Heuske. There's still no B in that name. And um, yeah, I'm going to talk uh, to you today about uh, what I've been up to and what will be the next steps and all that stuff. Um, across the last so what what happened uh, over the past couple of weeks since the last installment of these things and what i will be doing next and then we'll also have as usual we have a quick look at the anonymous usage tracking stats and yeah then we would usually have a q a um, the problem is that uh, this time no one sent in any questions uh, in, into the yeah question collection tool ever since i announced this uh, little broadcast thingy about a week ago and uh, the backlog also did not contain anything anymore so i'll just keep an eye on the live chat and if something pops up in there then i will do my best to answer it live <laughs> um and without preparation and uh, otherwise i will take it with me to be answered next time or something like that yeah and if there are no questions in the live chat either then i guess that means that i can just return to trying to figure out a bug that i'm currently hunting down <laughs> earlier than expected Okay, so speaking about the live chat, for those of you watching this live, which right now are the only people, because this is not a recording that now yet, this is completely live. Um, there is a live chat on the right, <laughs> on desktop and uh, below on mobile. And I will keep an eye on that. So if you have any questions that you want to uh, get answered, just shoot them in there and I'll try to keep track of them. Yeah. Okay, so first of all what have been up to the past couple of weeks um yeah the the most prominent part of what i've been up to are probably the three are uh, release candidates for one for one that i published ever since the last uh, octoprint on air episode um and i was actually hoping that i uh, could um, release the stable version so one for one final release early next week um, but over the course of the past 24 hours, I got uh, two bugs reported. Uh, one turned out to have been an issue actually with a third party client, so with Octofarm in that case. Uh, the other one I'm still trying to figure out. Um, and also I'm trying to figure out if this is actually a, a problem that is a one for one specific or if it exists in older versions as well, even though it cannot really be triggered easily there. Um, yeah, so I've been trying to wrap my head around this thing for the past couple of hours now and uh, will also have to get back to it at least to document my current um, yeah my, my, my current uh, uh, results of the of the preliminary analysis um, in order to be able to take up uh, where I left off on uh, yeah on um, on Monday. If push comes to shove, but maybe I, I, I still I still might get an epiphany and then figure out what the problem is. Um, the symptom is that if you run the auto detection thing, then sometimes for some reason the state switches get lost, and that leads to an, an interface that is basically out of sync with the backend, which call which which means you cannot you you can click disconnect, but nothing visually happens, and uh, yeah, stuff just gets out of whack, and you will have to reload in order to get it to sync back. Um, yeah, so somewhere somehow state switches get lost, and I fixed a similar issue in the maintenance branch a couple of weeks ago, and I already um, merged this onto the one for one um, staging maintenance branch, but yeah, it doesn't seem to fix it completely, so I'm going to have to. Uh, so I'll have to dig deeper. Um, okay, yeah, so that is the current state there. So depending on what I figure out with regards to this bug, it's either uh, yeah the, the fourth release candidate next week or the stable release next week, if I realize it's not actually a bug that is, yeah, that constitutes a regression. Um, yeah, but I'll have to figure that out. Uh, all in all, so far, I have to say that uh, the yeah the, the feedback for one for one has been fairly positive, or rather barely non-existent. So, uh, what I got back mostly was uh, either um, yeah I'm running into this and this issue, which was a very very minor uh, number of cases, or everything is working fine, 
and um, based on the statistics that I'm seeing, which I'm also going to show you later, uh, is uh, it, it looks like it's running very fine for a lot of people out there. So yeah, the, the issues that we are currently still looking at are yeah the aforementioned bug. And uh, sadly, I also got some reports that lacked uh, pro proper bug reports. So no logs, no reproduction steps, no uh, have you tested this in safe mode, yes or no, uh, re re replies and all that. Just a simple XYZ doesn't work uh, in, in 141 anymore. And yeah, simply because uh, this keeps happening and it frankly also seems to get worse <laughs> from release candidate to, to release candidate. Let me just reiterate here that I, I'm really grateful if you report back on release candidate, but if you do not also give me back, uh, give me uh, ticket templates and reproduction steps and all that, then the report is pretty worthless, sadly. So if I, all I know is that something doesn't work and then you do not also provide me with the information that I need in order to figure out why it doesn't work or even how to reproduce it or information about your setup and at, at the very least the log files and the terminal communication and all that, then I'm completely blind. So the only thing that happens in that case is I know something is some is somehow wrong for someone out there. I do not know if that is an issue for other people but uh, them and um, usually unless I'm very very lucky I have no idea how to reproduce it and cannot fix it and that is a very frustrating experience for me and it is also probably in the long term a very frustrating experience for those of you who report issues on release candidates because when I don't when I'm not able to fix them then they will continue to persist in the stable release version. And that is certainly not the goal of the release candidate. We want to iron out bugs. We do not want to document them and just go and ship with them. So um, yeah, please, 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 please. If you do not want me to uh, repeatedly hit my head against the wall in frustration, um, just fill out the ticket template when reporting issues with the release candidates. Uh, do not abuse the feedback ticket uh, for drive by i have a, i have a problem things and 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 certainly at, if you do that i mean sometimes we all are in a hurry i can totally understand that sometimes you will just say hey by the way i have a problem here and um i get all the information to you later and fill out a, bug, a proper bug report later this is fine um just to give me a heads up and maybe collect other people's experience on the on the on the problem as well um but yeah you need to follow up on that um a ticket that i don't have uh i don't have logs and 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 all that on is just sadly very worthless and um that is not helpful during the release candidate phase in fact it only adds on uh, to what is already a quite stressful experience for me usually at least at this time it was quite calm but it also i also had cases where yeah it was just constant bug uh, analysis and trying to figure out where something went wrong and if it even was an octoprint and all that. So yeah, please help me here and just report, uh, do proper bug reports. Yeah, everything is linked from the release notes of release candidates, how to do that. It's also linked from the feedback ticket as well. And I know that it takes some time to collect the information that is requested there, but it's like five minutes tops and, um, yeah, it's five minutes for you uh, versus half a day or a day of turnaround and analysis uh, requests and so something else for me. And for me, it's multiplied by anyone who reports something. So yeah, just please provide the stuff. Yeah, okay, but that was me on my soapbox. Um, what else did I do? So um, for the next thing, I'm going to quickly switch you over to the... Um, to the other screen because um, I created a recovery page um, for 142 actually. Um, it will look something like this and you can access it under, uh, as, as, as written here, under your Octoprint instance, then slash recovery slash, or, or also the trading slash is not necessary, but yeah, but still. And it will allow you to run um, the core system commands. So you can shut down the system, reboot the system, restart Octoprint, and also very importantly, uh, restart Octoprint in safe mode through this page. 
it will allow you access to the backup and restore functionality built into Octoprint unless you have disabled that uh, um, explicitly and not visible in the screenshot. But if the printer is currently correct, uh, connected and maybe also printing something, then you will also be able to disconnect from the printer there and cancel the uh, and or cancel the ongoing print job. And um, yeah, this is something that I have been meaning to build for quite a while now, um, since it can easily happen, even though I do my very best to keep things error resilient uh, everywhere, that through some third party plugin um, or something like that, you somehow manage to, uh, or rather a third party plugin somehow manages to nuke the, the, the regular inter user interface. So you cannot access it anymore in order to do stuff like restarting Octoprint in safe mode or disabling certain plugins or even just shutting it down properly without just cutting power, which you really never should be doing since it can severely corrupt your file system and cause all kinds of issues. So this is going to be in place in the future, not in 141 yet, but in 142, as I said, so that you can still access all this stuff after you log in as an admin user, I must say. Um, and uh, yeah, do all this, all these, let's say, maintenance or um, yeah, emergency uh, tasks, even if something is completely broken. I mean, there are still possible scenarios where something is really, really completely broken. So if the Octoprint server is not even able to boot up, then this won't help you because that needs to be served by the Octoprint server and it also needs to access some of the internal APIs. But as long as um, the server is in principle running and it's just a default uh, user interface that's shot, that will help you out of that pickle. Um, and another big thing that I did and only just finished yesterday actually is, um, yeah, my, my test automation got a major, major, major boost. So, um, I'm not sure if I if I ever explained this yet, uh, how I usually go about doing releases and all that. But um, yeah, it involves a lot of manual or rather it involved, I need to say now, it involved a, a, a lot of manual steps. So um, when I prepare a new release candidate or a new full stable release, what I do is I, um, I tag it, I push it to a release test re repository and then uh, I run through various update scenarios. So I flash uh, various versions of um, Octopi on SD cards, boot them up in a, in a, in 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 my um, yeah in my little test Pi cluster here, um, create some kind of basic start version environment thingy. So for example, Octopi 016, but the Octoprint version on it is updated to the current stable release or something like that. And then from this starting state, I see if I can successfully update to whatever I just created as a new release or release candidate through the regular software update mechanism. And if I can, then I also do some quick checks if everything looks as, as it should and the UI works and uh, connecting works and all that. So. What this involved so far was for every single one of these tests, which usually are around seven, six or seven at, uh, at the minimum for every release candidate and release and for stable major releases even more, um, is that I need to power off the Pi, eject the SD card from it, insert the SD card in a card reader on my PC, flash a fresh Octopi image on it, um, eject it and reinsert it in order to be able uh, to have the OS recognize the boot partition properly, then write the Wi-Fi configuration and the host name and maybe also the password to the boot partition, remove it from the card reader, reinsert it into the Raspberry Pi, and then power on the Pi and wait for everything to boot. And then I can log in and um, run through the first setup wizard and get it to the point where I actually want it to be in order to even start the update tests. So this obviously takes a lot, lot of time and it's fairly annoying. And frankly, it's also very much mind numbing. And it's happened a couple of times now that while I was waiting for that thing to flash, I would then start working on the release notes or I don't know, take care of someone on the forums or something. 
and then the flashing finished and I didn't notice and I lost time during that. And yeah, it's just a horrible time sink, all this setup stuff. And because it is such a time intensive, um, yeah, time, time in intensive um, process, which I uh, not really can get rid of though, because it's important to test against the full actual Octopi images that people run out there and the actual hardware and not something simulated or something. I, uh, yeah, I have been trying to find a solution for years now uh, to automate all or at least most of this so that I no longer have to play disc jockey all the damn time, but ju can just ba yeah, basically hit a button and everything assembles itself automatically and then I can just run the update test or maybe even automate the update test itself. And so over the course of the past couple of ye uh, weeks, <laughs> I finally sat down and, um, and, and, and thought that. So, um, um, so th it, the, the solution is twofold. First of all, I already had a bunch of uh, development tools for a long time, which I've also now also shared at this uh, um, URL. Uh, which consists, oh, which is powered by a big FEP file uh, that's called that way because it is um, the file format or yeah, a file that is used by uh, the Python-based Fabric tool, so FAB, not FAP, in case you wondered. <laughs> and um, yeah, that that FAP file had a lot of um, yeah, a lot of tasks in it already in order to help me provision an, an Octopi image. So to write it, to at least automatically generate the, the Wi-Fi config and the, the host name and all that and write it to a, um, to a, to a mount point that I told it to write it to and all that. But, um, uh, yeah, it, 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 it did not yet do a whole lot of stuff to help me get from freshly, freshly fleshed image over to, um, and now we can do the update test. So there was no user provisioning. There was no um, automatic completion of the first run setup wizard. There was no um, ensuring that we actually have the start version that we want and that the proper release channel is configured and all that. And the first thing that I did was to enhance this fab file in order to uh, do all this for me. So it now can provision the users that I, some some basic user accounts that I need in order to be able to test stuff. It can uh, pre-configure the, pre the release channel. It makes sure that I'm not going to get bothered by the uh, setup wizard anymore on these freshly fl fleshed instances. And uh, it also ensures that the cor correct version of Octoprint is pre-installed. So um, that was the first step. And during 141 RC2, we, we, that was the, uh, yeah during during the release cycle of that one. That was actually already used and already saved me a whole bunch of time, but I still had to play disc jockey. So this uh, physical swapping of SD cards in and out of the card reader and all that, that was still needed. And yeah, that was um, when I looked around the net, if there were any, any, any ways to yeah emulate an SD card or maybe uh, multiplex an SD card or something. And then I finally found the solution to all my problems. And uh, so I now am the proud owner of two so-called USB SD Max boards, which on one end look like a little SD card that you just put into the, the device you want to test. And on the other side, it has a micro USB port and you can connect that to a Linux box. And then via a command, you can switch whether the SD card is to be available to the test uh, to the device that you want to test on, in that case, a Raspberry Pi, or the um, the host system. And it gets exposed as a regular USB mass storage device uh, with full access, so you can flash it easily. And so I used that and some other bits uh, in order to build. Um, uh, this um, so this is the prototype and um, Power Weasel, who's currently on the chat, might remember me sending uh, this picture out um, uh, because that was a um, yeah that was one of those days where I couldn't sleep and just had to figure out if it works or not and got really curious. So what you're seeing here is a Raspberry Pi four acting as a controller and controlling the um, the SD Max, which is currently they're sitting inside a Raspberry Pi 0W 
and the power of the Raspberry Pi uh, Zero W, so the device under test here, is piped through a USB hub. And this USB hub also is a bit of a of a gimmicky one because um, that can also be controlled by the Raspberry Pi. So the, the Raspberry Pi can switch the output um, and switch the ports on and off. And the combination of that allows me now to automate the part where I have to power off the Pi, eject the card, inject the card into a card reader, flash the card, uh, provision the card, then reinsert the card into the Pi and power that one up. So all of this can now be done by a, yeah, a couple of commands, a handful of commands from this uh, central controller. And um, this was the, was the prototype. And since yesterday, I'm now, uh, I now have um, this here sitting on my desk. And this is the same thing, but with two devices under test, the two pies you see um, stacked vertically on the side are a three and a two and uh, the Raspberry Pi 4, still the controller, and uh, the USB power hub thingy, the switchable one, sits underneath. And I also attached um, uh, um, yeah, a 5.5 times 2.5 millimeter power socket there because the micro USB input of that certainly was not up to serve both of these uh, with proper amperage. That thing itself allows uh, two amps on, uh, on all of the outputs but yeah, the input was a bit, <laughs> okay. So now it's a bit beefier and so far it seems to work fine. And um, I also made sure it is really fine by making sure that I do not have any hotspots here on the, on the power intake and all that. So this is a picture of my Fleur that I shot. And um, I put this a bit through the ropes today already, but it will have its actual prime time either during the next RC or the stable release. And um, I will also, uh, yeah, once I, I have actually run through a release cycle with that, I will also uh, see that I publish a post with some more details on this on the Octovlog. Um, if you are wondering right now what parts I use here and maybe also want the laser cut files or something like that, um, all of them are published on, um, on github.com slash octoprint slash dev tools. And there is also the fab files that I now use. And I have a bunch of fab file, uh, commands now that allow me to actually flash stuff. Um, and maybe, yeah, maybe just let me quickly show this to you because why not? Um, so I only just pushed this publicly, publicly today. Um, but yeah, so um, for example, if I want to uh, flash the Pi 3 in this setup with Octopi 0170, this little command here will take care of powering down the Pi, um, um, setting the, the SD card into host mode, flashing it, provisioning it with Wi-Fi credentials, host name and password file, and then reversing all that. So um, uh, moving the SD card back to the Pi, basically, and then powering on the Pi. And combined with the existing stuff that I yeah also extended over the course of the past couple of, um, of weeks, which is, for example, this kind of command, which for an existing and running Octopi instance uh, here on Octopi 3.lan, which is incidentally the, the Pi 3 in this uh, test rig, it, this command here will make sure to um, set the release channel to maintenance, fake a new release 141RC3, so that the software update can detect it and uh, make sure also that the starting version is actually updated to 141RC2. So this is to ensure that I have an 017 or, or whatever Octopi base I, I used, um, that I have the base image updated to run Octopi 141RC2. A user is already added. The thing has been switched to the maintenance release channel. Uh, stuff is set up so that it will detect the release of a 141RC3 version, which I then, once I open this page in the browser, will uh, yeah be immediately updatable and I can just click and stuff works. And I even can combine these things here into one longish command line. So 
flash the Py3 to 0.17.1 and then provision it further to make sure that all these starting scenario uh, steps are applied. And uh, that will also ensure that, for example, this command will wait until the Py is actually available. So I don't have to check, is it up yet? Is it up yet? Is it up yet? But this will all, all be automated by that. And once everything has been done and it has been flashed and all that, it will even open a web browser to this location so that I can just immediately start testing. And uh, yeah, something like these test steps. So click on the button to update is also something that I could still automate um, in the future. So for now I will run it like that, but uh, yeah, I'll probably also automate it further. And um, it's, I have to say, I am ridiculously excited about this whole setup and uh, very proud also of it, I have to I have to admit. Um, and it will save me so much time in the future. And it, it will also remove one of the mind numbing parts, mind, most mind numbing parts of the whole release cycle. And I'm, I'm so glad that I found this, uh, this, this, this board, this USB SD max stuff, these, these adapter boards, these, or this, yeah, these, these virtual SD cards or SD cards, uh, multiplexers as I bought them are incredibly expensive. So one of these boards runs you, uh, sets you back about, about 100 euros, but frankly, yeah, I had a lot of, yeah let's say the pain <laughs> was big enough that I was able to justify this cost for the project. And um, yeah, it works, it works flawlessly so far. And it's absolutely wonderful to just be able to run one line of code and all this stuff is gets taken care of you for you. Yeah. And since I just saw the question in the live chat uh, by John, um, who makes these boards, um, yeah, you can find all the stuff here in the in the in the test rig subfolder on this on this repository in this octoprint slash dev tools repository, and you can also find the laser cut files there and also the electronics that I use. Um, so the the power the, the switchable um, USB hub is uh, that one that cost me around uh, thirty five euros, I think, and then I have two of these right now, which are one hundred each. Yeah, quite expensive, as I said, but in that case, certainly worth it. I'm currently also experimenting with, an, uh, with a 40 millimeter fan on top of the Pi because it gets quite hot still. Pi 4, yeah, even though it has a big passive heatsink, it still runs fairly hot. Yeah, um, also let me just uh, use this opportunity to uh, do a big shout out to Mr. Beam. Um, I got mine sitting there uh, and that is the laser cutter uh, that I used to cut all these parts and to quickly, yeah, also to quickly prototype the mounting hardware. So I had the rough idea on how to arrange things, but uh, yeah, the rest was then quickly done in Fusion 360 and a couple of round trips with the laser and all that. And that is just, yeah, that was just the perfect tool for this, because if I had had to wait for parts like this to print on the printer, that would have, yeah throttled my iteration speeds in order to figure out how to actually fit everything together correctly. Yeah. Uh, and also, just in case you didn't know, this laser back there is actually running Octoprint officially. So um, it gets shipped with Octoprint on board. So I just love it. Um, yeah. So as I said about all this stuff, I will uh, see that I push a blog post with more details and also uh, yeah, why I made the decisions that I made and all that um, as soon as I can, uh, certainly only after I've actually put this through a regular update scenario, because right now it has only been experiments here and there and they work flawlessly, but still, um, yeah. But yeah, I'm, I'm so happy about that thing. I cannot even put it into words. Right. Um, back to me for now. And um, yeah, another thing that I did, and this all fits, um, uh, this, this all fits still in this, this whole automation FTV, <laughs> FTW uh, scenario. Uh, I also finally did something that I've also been meaning to do for years now and added some end-to-end -end testing to Octoprint. So all of the commits that I push in the future uh, are going to also have an end-to-end -end test suit run um, powered by Cypress IO. Um, and yeah, that, that, which is 
let's say a browser automation solution that also can um yeah that that runs uh, that that runs as a test suite so um those of you familiar with stuff like that might know about uh, selenium uh, this is not selenium this is um completely implemented from scratch as far as i understand but yeah it also has been way way more fun to use than my past experiences uh, were with selenium and um yeah, what it does is uh, right now the test suite is fairly basic uh, for now. It only does some smoke testing. So it will try to log into Octoprint. It will try to log out of Octoprint. It will try uh, an invalid username and password. Um, it will try if it can connect to the virtual printer with some auto detection also, and then disconnect again from it. And it will check if it can upload a file successfully. And it gets also then it, it gets it back in the file list if it's visible in the file list after that. And then it uh, will also check if the UI actually loads without any errors being logged to console. So very, very basic, but run on each and every commit. So if something might break the might break something like that um yeah i will immediately know and uh, it will also allow me to rest <laughs> assured that the basic operations in fact do work so if someone comes in and says something like i don't know the current commit doesn't load at all then if this end-to-end -end test is green then i know okay apparently that's not a general issue and we have to dig here on why so the the first analysis step that i would usually have to do in such cases has now been taken care of for me again by another automation so that is really really nice and i have to also say this using cypress uh, for this stuff is somewhat kind of fun uh, so i really enjoy writing tests with it and um yeah this is also what i'm thinking about maybe using uh, to further automate the release um, cycle stuff. Yeah, so to then do the uh, initial update clicking and all that. <laughs> ah, sorry, I'm still a bit, um, my nose is a bit stuffed. <laughs> um, right, and uh, yeah, I did a lot of stuff over the past couple of weeks because I'm still not done telling you what I was up to. Um, Another thing that I have been meaning to do for quite a while now is um, adding an automated validation of plugin repository files. So we have this plugin repository under plugins.octoprint.org and that gets um, gets fed from some, yeah, basically from some static page build based on Jekyll, which uses um, files, plugin files that also have some metadata in them and from them, uh, all the plugin repository itself and the JSON files that Octoprint consumes from the plugin repository in order to show you the plugin browser in there as well and all that gets built. And it turns out, uh, as we found uh, over the past couple of years already, but also over the past months specifically, when, when the plugin activity picked up a bit more, uh, also due to the Python 2 and 3 situation, is that, yeah, a lot of times the metadata that people submit is actually invalid in some way so the indentation is not correct so stuff that should be in one part of the file is actually not in that part and since uh, due to that will not probably get evaluated or um, screenshots are uh, yeah not correctly referenced because they are actually slightly named differently in the in the in the parts that are uploaded and all that and um yeah, in order to avoid all these issues in the future, I wrote a little validator script, script that will validate all this metadata and, and test some things. And uh, if it finds any issues, we'll report this back uh, on the pull request. And I also used it to run against all the, all the already registered plugins, and that also found a bunch of issues that we now fixed. So there are now plugins on the plugin repository that so far never had screenshots and now they have screenshots and that so far claimed they were only Python 2 compatible and in fact they are now Python 3 compatible. Um, things like this. And um, yeah, the hope is, and I'm fairly sure that will be uh, something that will be fulfilled, is that this will save me and the plugin repository team over all in all uh, yeah, sometime in the future and make submissions in general less error prone because instead of having to wait for one of us to check if um, your pull request is sound and, and solid and, and, and contains all the metadata fields that are needed and 
and such uh, things. Uh, all of that will now be done for you by a GitHub action and you will immediately see a little check notification inside your pull request that will tell you if something went wrong and if so, what. So that is the idea here. Seems to work well. And another thing that I also promised uh, to take a look at last time was um, to, um, yeah, to, to help Guy with the with with making uh, Octopi now run on Python three by default, or rather the Octo print environment on Octopi running Python three by default, and that's been done as well. So the current O eighteen nightlies will have Octoprint running in a Python three environment, and. Um, also, uh, uh, the, the nightlies can now also be built by GitHub, <laughs> uh, by GitHub Actions. So, yeah. Okay, that was a long, 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 long monologue on what I've been up to. And uh, yeah, a lot of stuff um, changed to the better, I would say, uh, about all the, all the stuff around Octoprint. So not only did I do a lot of stuff inside the code, but also around the code, which was long, long needed and um, I have to say that I will certainly focus more on things like that in the future that make my life as a developer and uh, the life of all the uh, contributors and also of plugin authors and, and such like uh, such way easier because it's in, in the long term it saves so much more time than it takes to do that um, that yeah I really should have done all of this way 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 sooner but yeah now at least I have done it. Okay, um, next steps. Um, as I mentioned, next week, I hope to either push one for one stable or possibly a fourth release candidate. Either way, I will new, use the new test rig in order to um, um, yeah, run through the update test. Um, and um, another thing that I want to look into is uh, to um, yeah, so recently I saw some issues with plugin compatibility due to the use of undocumented interfaces and uh, issues that could easily be tested for, like yeah, dependencies that are used that now have to be renamed or or or, or third-party dependencies that have a have a change in behavior, which still Octoprint needs to update due for due to due to security reasons. Um, and uh, yeah, so either uh, things that might affect plugins, the third party plugins, and which could probably be easily uh, detected through an automated test, but so far, uh, yeah, so far nothing like that is in place. And so the plugin authors need to made, be made aware of stuff like that and keep in touch and keep an eye on the release notes of the release candidates and all that. And my feeling is that so far this is not really happening, sadly. Um, even though I put these heads up messages in there and repeatedly also uh, announced them in the release announcements on the Octoblog and all that, it still usually happens that there are some compatibility issues with some plugins due to whatever reason. And um, to combat that, I was thinking that it would really be nice to have some basic plugin validator. So similar to what I did from the plugin repository, which, which checks the metadata files, something, a simple GitHub action that you can just throw into your GitHub repository and have run against your code um, that detects stuff like this. And maybe also fires up Octoprint and loads your plugin in there and sees if yeah, everything still loads or the server is now dead or the, the, the UI is now throwing errors and all that. And you cannot see this right now, but I have a couple of ideas jotted down on the whiteboard to my right about how to do that. And uh, I know that it has been a, a, a great uh, addition to Home Assistant, um, something like that. And this is actually where I got the idea to do that. Home Assistant also has something like a plugin system, though they call it custom integrations. And um, what they do now provide for a couple of months uh, already is a, a, single, a simple, very small snippet that you can just paste into a workflow file for your, um, for your custom integration. And then GitHub Actions will run this, uh, yeah, this, this image linked in this um, workflow and check all the stuff that needs checking and yeah, tell you when 
all of a sudden something that you're doing is no longer being supported or something like that. And it, that way you, you know before the stable release of something hits because you will already get build errors during, uh, during the RC phase in that case, or maybe even during development. So it could also use, uh, it could also use the maintenance branch, for example. Um, so that is the current idea. Um, I still need to iron out some details on how to do that. And it will also have, um, it will also involve, uh, yeah, some Docker file writing, but, uh, thankfully due to my hobby of home automation <laughs> here at home, I'm, 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 by now I have this figured out quite well, I think. And yeah, so this is something that I want to look into. Uh, I cannot promise that it will be done by the next installment of this uh, broadcast, but it's, uh, but I hope to be able to give some updates on it at least. So what else do I want to do? Um, I desperately need some time off because my batteries are severely depleted and need some recharging. So this is also something that I will tackle soon. And um, another reason for that is also that I still haven't made it fully through Witcher 3. <laughs> So that needs uh, needs to be taken care of before before cyber, uh, cyberpunk uh, um, gets released. Yeah. And uh, other than that, uh, obviously, I also still need to continue work on 2.0 uh, or rather properly get started on that. Um, I mentioned last time that I switched it to require Python 3. So the devil branch is now Python 3 only. But it still has all these Python 2 leftovers in there from the compatibility compatibility layers. And yeah, I need to get rid of those. And I also still want to migrate all the feature requests to the forum uh, from the bug tracker because yeah, it's the bug tracker is 90% or something like that. It's, it's just feature requests. And it would certainly make sense to have them in a more community driven uh, place and leave the bug tracker to bugs. Um, yeah. And another thing that I also still have on, have on my agenda, but I don't know yet when I will get around to do it, is um, starring off plugins in the plugin repository via GitHub stars as well. And um, yeah, also, I still also want to somehow publish the stats to everyone, but yeah, long, long term goal. Speaking about stats, time to take a quick look at them. So uh, I'm going to switch you back over here. Yeah, behold, all in all its glory. Um, and I prepared it earlier, the, the, the dashboard, because we remember if I, usually when I try to refresh it during uh, during these uh, during these live events, then it's the, the server comes to a hinding grawl, uh, hind, uh, grinding halt, not a hinding grawl. Uh. Okay, so over the course of the last seven days alone, we had 62,781 no uh, instances again those are octoprint instances that opted into the anonymous usage tracking if you do not opt in you will not be counted here i will not know that you even exist uh total print time about the uh, across the last seven days uh, were 81 years this is the rough um, octoprint version distribution and the interesting bit here is that we are seeing an uptick here in the Python 3 adoption, which I'm guessing is also due to this nifty little um, script that uh, Charles <laughs> developed um, that allows you to quickly switch an Octopi instance over to, use, uh, to using a Python 3 virtual environment. Yeah, that is really nice to see this number finally going up, even though obviously it's still Mostly, primarily Python 2, but at least we are seeing more adoption here, which is great news, considering that it will also help uh, me if to, to iron out any issues that might still be in there. Yeah, uh, printed hours per version are, qu are fairly normal. And just uh, out of curiosity, I also queried the scene instances count for the last 30 days. And that was again in the 86,000 range. So yeah, not, no, not much change there. Um, it's still fairly uh, static in that regard. Um, I promised you a view at the 141 deployment. So these are the individual version statistics limited to 141 RC uh, versions. And uh, yeah, this is a fairly normal um, release candidate life cycle, so to speak, or adoption, adoption rate. So the first one 
doesn't see so many. The second one, which so this one only was out there for three days, and the second one was out there for a week, and the third is also now out there for a bit over a week, uh, going on two even. Um, and yeah, we are looking at roughly 800 instances all in all uh, that ran one form or another of a 141 RC. Um, and they also have been printing quite happily RC3 the most with uh, 8,350 hours across the past 30 days. And yeah, the rest accordingly um, spread out. And we also see the version distribution here. Uh, don't get confused about these dot dev thingies here. Those are um, versions that are not yet tagged, but were development versions of what was going to be RC2, which got counted here. And that was probably my local development instance each time. And yeah, just with several versions in between. That was that. And also interesting as usual, um, is the environment, so the, 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 the hardware basically that people run out there and also the OS, um, no surprises there. What might be interesting is, um, and that's also something that Weasel already asked, how many uh, O18, uh, Octopi O18 versions are already being used, because um, Weasel also built uh, a beta against 64-bit. Uh, and I just realized, I think I cannot distinguish 32 and 62 bit here, a uh, 64 bit here, but still. Um, so we currently, or, or rather the past 30 days, we had 182 instances that were running um, an uh, 0.18 version of Octopi. Uh, the problem here is that we do not know if this was the build image by Weasel or if this was an official nightly, but still people are running it. Not many people, but people are running it. Yeah, and then we have the usual uh, firmware groups and uh, and uh, also the unsafe firmware warnings, which keep on being quite static in the numbers. Well, um, nothing new here, I guess. Okay, so that was that. Now is the point where I would usually say we are starting the Q&A segment. Oh, interesting. Look at that. There's a glitch. Oh, God. And it stays. OK, well, we, we will have to wait, uh, have to live with that. Um, the thing is, as I said, nothing in the backlog. So um, I'm going to quickly scroll through the live chat and see if there is anything. And other than that, I spent so much time today on the um, on the what I've been up to part that we are actually almost at an hour already. So, yeah. Um, yeah, I answered who makes the micro SD cards with the with the, so the MOOCs stuff, or rather, I, I I I showed you where to find the link. Jim said he'd be happy to test uh, plug-in validation stuff. And he's seen an uptick of plugins being compatible as well. Yeah, to Python 3. Yes, um, I also saw noticed that and I'm really, very happy of that. Speaking of which, might actually be interesting. What numbers do we currently see? Um, yeah, so we're already at 65% now. I can remember the day when we, when we um, um, got across the 50% border and that was, ooh, yeah, awesome. So yeah, things are happening. That is really, really nice. And yeah, also the plugin stats, of course, are now visible here, right? So um, you can always take a look at the top 10 and uh, what has been trending this week. Um, and also on every single plugin page, let's use that one. Um, you will see the, the last release and how many releases there were and how many GitHub stars issues open, closed and all that. So I already showed that in a, in one of the last installments. So just wanted to repeat it. Um, it might be worth taking a look on the plugin repository a couple of times. Also, all of this information will now be put into the plugin browser in Octoprint as well, starting with 141. Right. So that was that. I don't see any questions in the live chat, so I'm going to switch you all back to me. 
and uh, yeah um i guess in that case i'm just going to wrap this up now um the next one of these uh yeah it will probably be rather early september than late august because as i said i need to take some time off soon uh i haven't done that really since christmas i think so yeah it's about time um and yeah uh, the batteries need recharging as i said uh, as usual i will post appointment to patreon as uh, again um so that you uh, will know about it and, and we get notified about that uh, if you don't get the patreon uh, updates by the way you should maybe check your spam folder and um yeah um with that being said i hope it was interesting for you again and um uh, thank you very much for uh, attending it's always great when i don't have to just talk to myself here and uh yeah until the next time all that's left to say is uh, stay healthy and uh, happy printing bye